Today is the 21st oh, day. Halabai. Oh, Baruch Haba. Oh, Baruch Haba. Came back for uh, Rosh Hashanah. You didn't like it there? Where? You came back for Rosh Hashanah. Yes. You didn't want to be in 770 for Rosh Hashanah. You're probably never in 770 for Rosh Hashanah. You got this. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Right. So we're in chapter 20. And uh, today is the 21st of uh, Elul and the 24th of September. Okay. So we're towards the end now of Daf Kuf Kavav Amud So we had a long discussion about how many angels there are and why we need so many angels. And the bottom line was that from the angels we learn about ourselves, from how Hashem creates the angels, that the process in the angels is that in the world of Atzilus, so the Midos, they combine with one another ad infinitum, meaning in an infinite manner. Chesed can combine with Gvura, but then you can get the Chesed of Gvura of Chesed, and then the Gvura of Chesed of Gvura of Chesed, and you can go that, that way as many as you want. And so there's an infinite number of sources, and uh, there's an infinite number of an- and there's a finite number of angels that can come out of one, each of these sources. And so that's how Hashem runs the world. And we said, what do we mean that He runs the world with this? That He uses the angels as an extension of my sabratius, of the creation. So after creation, the powers that act in the world, they're angels. And so we said that's why there were generations that tried to call upon them and to use them, we, we don't do that anymore. But the same thing is in us, that we also have a very complex heart with many, many emotions, very many sources of emotions, many nuances of emotions and thoughts. And each one of these we can use many words to describe. So every time that we describe a feeling, just, if you just have love or fear, that's easy. But if you have the fear within love, what is that? So we always say the fear within love is that the father disciplines the child. So the child feels fear, but he knows that his father loves him. Who uses that? Book of Proverbs. In, in, in Mishle, the book of Proverbs, King Solomon is constantly addressing the reader as Bni, my son. Why does he call him my son? He's my father, he's not my father. But he wants to discipline me. He wants to give me ethics. So he says the only way that I'll listen is if he treats me, and, or if he gives me the feeling that I'm his son. Then I know that he wants my best, he has my best interest in mind. So maybe I'll listen. So that's like the fear within love. But then you can have the love within the fear within love. Because sometimes <coughs> he tells you to fear the sin, and sometimes he tells you to love the Torah. So you have the love within the discipline, within the ethics, within the love. And then it can keep getting more and more nuanced and goes on and on. It keeps many, many words to describe each one of these. Each one of these verses is an angel. So in the olden days, what they used to do was they would uh, identify a verse, or even a series of verses that they thought was related to a certain um, uh, uh, emotion, feeling, something like that. And then they'd play with the letters and they'd get names of angels from that. Uh, so, so you have these books like Shimush Te'ilim. All the Shimushim, all the books that are called Shimush. So what they do is they're, 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 they're using the letters inside the verses to call upon a certain angel. And from the time of the Arizal, nobody does that anymore. Because the Arizal said it's not for us. And so we don't do that anymore. But comes the Tzemach Tzedek and it says, From this I can learn about myself. That when I'm davening to Hashem, when I'm davening, I'm, I'm, I'm saying words. And these words, so I didn't write the davening, the, the members of the great assembly, the Knesset Sagdola, they, they wrote them. But the purpose is the same. It's to bring out the, those same emotions. And how do you do that? So you have to have in mind what, you, what emotion you want to represent, and you bring it out. And the way that they do this, we'll see, is very complex. We do this in Psuche de Zimra that they are looking even at the, what is the corresponding thing in the world to bring this out. Meaning they don't just tell you, okay, let's just um, 
describe this emotion like uh, some soliloquy. I'm talking about myself, saying I feel like this, I feel like that. There's very little of that in, in Tehillim in general. And in Psukha de Zirma, there's almost nothing like that. What is there though? There are many, many similes and metaphors and, and, and parables that they take from nature. From the, and, and basically what they're saying is, to awaken this thing in myself, I have to find in nature something similar. And that awakens it in myself. And that's what I'm supposed to be going through. So that's the, the whole gist here of, of this chapter, where he's going. He's not going to be finished with this uh, chapter. He's going to... So he said that there is an infinite number of sources and a finite number of words you can say about each source. Each source is the emotion that's associated with it. <laughs> so uh, what can we do that... <laughs> so you need a feminine man. And like uh, David the Melech, he's kingdom, he's Malchus. So there's something very feminine about him that he's able to, uh, to, to, to articulate himself with so many words. But you're right, the men usually, the power of speech, we say, ah, okay, we said the, the power of speech came down into the world, <coughs> and women took nine measures, and, and, and men were left, all the men in the world were left, were left with one measure, which means that they can hardly speak. Yeah. Right. So, so. Okay, so now let's see what we're holding. So that that's basically what we what, what we learned when you were we weren't here. Um, where were we? Al Yuvan. So we're like about fifteen lines from the bottom of Kuf Gavav Amud Alef. Al Pizay Yuvan. Mash katov lutvunato ein mispar. De lichor atomu aich nofel lashon mispar al atvuna. Vavel elemei mar ein chaker. Okay, so this is a whole different topic that the Tzema Tzedek gets into in, in other places. There are many terms in Hebrew that start with the word Ein, meaning there is none. For instance, the one that's most famous, and we've said the most times in, this, in, these, in, the, in, in, in studying this, uh, this, uh, this uh, essay from him, Ein Sof, uh, Ein Sof, with no end. Or we just translate it sometimes as <laughs> infinite, limitless. But then we also saw many times en tachlit. En tachlit <laughs> means without purpose. There's no purpose. Uh, scientists like to say that the world has no purpose. So it's not necessarily a, a, a wrong idea. The pr- problem is that they take it too far, that they make everything into it doesn't have purpose. But it's not true. Uh, many things have purpose, and then at some point I have to acknowledge that Hashem has a level at which I don't understand the purpose, and there may be no purpose. Okay, and I, I, I say, I don't understand, and there may be no purpose. And so we say, I don't understand what the purpose of all these creatures are, and they may have no purpose. Only you, Hashem, understands why we need all these... But here he gives us two new ones that we haven't seen yet. Ein cheker ve ein mispar. Ein cheker means cannot be studied, cannot be researched, cannot be found. Okay. So for instance, uh, so I understand that the world works by some laws, but who says I can discover all the natural laws that go into the world's functioning? So about that I would say ein cheker. This is too difficult for me to figure out. It's too, what would we say this about? So the scientists don't like to say this about astronomy because they think they understand all of it. Or at least uh, they at least give that, that, that uh, aura that they understand. But let's go to medicine. In medicine, everybody agrees. Ein cheker, we don't know. <laughs> we, do, we know much less than we know. What do we do? We trial and error. We try all kinds of things. You Sometimes know, this works. You know, shows you, know, you know less. Okay, the more you know, the, the less you know. So, so we try all kinds of things. And then medicine is not a, a, an exact science, as they say. It's, it's a trial and error. What will work, as Reb Nachman says, in the, and I just saw a, Reb, uh, a letter from the Rebbe recently, uh, that he says exactly the same thing. It, it, it's, it's, it's from the Gemara, really, but you don't know if it's from the Talmud. It's the statement from the Talmud. The Talmud says that medicine, healing, depends on three things. The doctor, <laughs> the medicine, 
and the time it's administered. So you, have, you have to have timing in medicine. It's not as simple as it looks. There's medicines that will work in, the, in, in, in a certain time. Again, sometimes it's during what time in the, during the day. Sometimes it's what time during the disease, in the progression. Sometimes it's even not connected to the disease. It has to do with the person's uh, moral stance, whether he's done tshuva, other things. You give him before he's done tshuva, the medicine doesn't help at all. You give him after he's done tshuva, wow, boom, it helps perfectly. But it's not just the timing, it's obviously it's the medicine, which medicine you use, this we know. Uh, even when you have a whole class of medicines that are the same thing, same, same exact mechanism, some work and some <coughs> don't for certain people, we don't know why. And it's the doctor. <laughs> it also depends on <laughs> which doctor is giving it. <laughs> Modern medicine hates this, they don't like to hear that it depends on who the pharmacist who mixed the uh, medicine is, who the doctor who did the diagnosis is, who the doctor who's administering the medicine, if it needs to be administered internally. They don't like to hear this. But it's all dependent. It, it, it's very dependent. So we don't understand. It's in cheker. It's without end, these issues. They have some kind, the assumption is they have some kind of logic to them, but the logic is too complex for a human being to understand. Maybe AI will be able to figure it out. That would be interesting to see. Because AI doesn't think like a human being, it doesn't think at all. It just goes by patterns. And it can see patterns that human beings can't. So maybe it will discover things, and we still won't know what the mechanism is, we won't understand the logic, but we'll know that there is some kind of pattern here. So maybe that will work, and, uh, and, and I've been waiting to see, see this happen. And I, I don't see them going in this direction yet, they haven't figured this one out yet. In any case, so that's called Ein Chekov. There's also Ein Mispau, with uncountable, things that are uncountable. What is uncountable, for instance? The number of grains of sand on the beach. It's uncountable. You can estimate what it is, but you can't count it. doesn't matter what you'll do. You can never count it. You can only estimate. How many drops of water in the ocean? It's uncountable. Ein Mispau. How many stars in, in, the, in the sky? They used to think that it was uncountable. I don't know why they thought it was uncountable, because... Um, because they could count. There's about 3,000. Well, no, but they didn't know about that. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They, but they said, ah, they, uh, but right, they said yeah, King that's David that's says yeah. it's uncountable. Yeah, right. There's about 3,000 stars that you can the see with the naked stars. eye. Yeah, right. And there were people who saw this, so yet, I, they, knew yet they knew it was uncountable. Yeah, and so we so only know this now, that the only way we, can, we, we do this is by an estimation. Yeah. We say uh, we, we, we count what we see in one spot. But they knew but, uh, that because you would think it would limit it to their right, view. To the, but somehow they knew. So, so now he says, when I'm talking about um, these angels or this, this um, ability of Hashem to create myriad <coughs> things, many, many, many things, so I would assume that he would say that it should be in Chekir. Why? Because what we're talking about is not the number of creations, we're talking about the wisdom, the, the, under, the, the comprehension that went into creating them. Comprehension is, is an intellectual faculty. Why are you telling me that his comprehension has no number, it's uncountable? You should have said his comprehension, Hashem's thoughts, are not understandable, they're ineffable to me, they're, they're incomprehensible to me. That's what you should have said, Ein Chekir. Why are you saying, in the Pasuk, we say this every day, Uli Tvunato En Mispau, and his comprehension has no number, it's uncountable. Achayinyan de Tvuna Otiyot Benubat. So he says, the first thing to know is something that the Alter Rebbe mentioned, that this was one of his greatest innovations. It's surprising this is an innovation, but it was. He writes it in the Tanya, in a, in a, in a footnote in the Tanya, in one of the footnotes, that tvuna, that the word tvuna, comprehension, is made up of the letters of ben uvat. Okay? Ben uvat. Now, somebody will ask, how do you figure that? You have to use the bet twice. <laughs> but... That's why it's a Chiddush, because it's not so simple. Tvuna is taf bet vav nun hei, and the Alter Rebbe says it's ben vebat, a, a son and a daughter. Ki yesh bina ila uvinatata. There are two types of understanding. It's very important to know. When the Arizal and the Zohar describe understanding, they say there is the higher understanding and the lower understanding. Bina ila, binatata. 
פירוש בינה הילה, היינו עצמיות ההשגה, שאינה מקור למידות. It says, the higher understanding is a purely intellectual faculty. It does not give birth to emotions. It does not lead to emotions. It's like math. It's like the study of nature. If a person looks at the laws of mechanics and says, I'm insulted, or I love these, th- they're using some kind of metaphor. You don't get insulted and you don't love the laws of mechanics. You don't get insulted or love numbers. Now let me make this clear because <laughs> this is a huge problem. There's a lot of people who deal with either gematria or unfortunately with numerology. And then they come to think that there are good numbers and bad numbers. They say, oh, um, 358 is a good number. Why is it a good number? Because it's the name of Mashiach. Mashiach equals 350. It must be a good number. On the other hand, 350 it is also the gematria of Nachash, of the serpent. So is it good or bad? So anybody who attributes emotions, a, 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 an emotional um, measure or, or attribute to a number misses the point. They don't get it. They're mixing it up. And he said this about um, uh, whatever his name is, David Attenborough and BBC many times, that he tells us what's going on in the animal kingdom, and he makes it into a human world with good and evil and, and all this. I, so I, my, my wife watches a lot of these, so recently she's shown me a few, and he says it's better because he's, he's now talking about struggle. Instead of talking about this is good or bad. Struggle, that exists in the animal world, and you can't say whether it's good or bad. It's just struggle. Good and bad is a human assessment, and it has to do with our heart. It has nothing to do with the mind. So if somebody thinks about good and evil, about physics, about chemistry, <laughs> there are good elements and bad elements. They're not good and they're not bad. They're just elements. So that's a mixing of categories. It's a categorical mistake. So this is called higher understanding. Supernal understanding, binaila, is pure intellect. It has no connection to emotions. You don't connect it. It's not connected at all. Sheinama kolamidot. Ken, but that they don't mean love in the, in, the, in the emotional sense. They mean they have a knack for it. They mean they enjoy it. But what are they talking about? Not, they can't say, But physics is better than uh, chemistry because I enjoy physics. And I, no, it's you personally, you have an act for it. You, you, you have a connection to it. But it's got nothing to do with the thing in and of itself. <laughs> But lower, compre- lower Bina, lower understanding, is already talking about when Bina becomes the mother. And, it begin, and why we call it the mother? Because now it's going to give birth to emotions. When it begins to give birth to emotions, that's something entirely different. That's not pure understanding anymore. That's already, like somebody would say, um, I love physics. Okay. Physics should be uh, beneficial to humanity or something like that. That's already taking it into an applied <coughs> area where you begin to say, I'm going to judge it based on, or you look at uh, some assessment of something, I don't know. You, you, you read a novel, and the novel's purpose is to give you certain emotions. It's to make you feel a certain way. Uh, all the movies in Hollywood almost are, are, are made to do that. They're made to... So, right. So they don't do it through... Uh, they can't touch you, they can't kiss you, they can't... They go through your mind. You're watching it. <laughs> But it's awakening your emotions already. So you're understanding, you're comprehending what's going on. And if you comprehend what's going on, you begin to feel something. Not all the movies are like that. There are movies that are meant to play with your mind. And they do something entirely different. They don't want you to feel this way or that way. And they do a good job. There's some that really do this. That they're really good at making you think. And, and not, to, not to make you uh, feel one way or another. For instance, a movie about nature should be like that. should make you uh, appreciate, but it shouldn't make you feel a certain way. So I said that they used to do that. BBC used to do that. Now they do it less. But the news today <laughs> is entirely lower understanding. They show you a picture and they tell you what to feel. 
and they push you in that direction. They want you to feel this way. What? Yeah, it's all marketing. Uvavodat Hashem, haynu kshe midbonen bigdulat Hashem v'tifarto, v'nasa asaga v'itbonenut makor leitpalut, shenimshach mizeh b'sichlo, ech sheraui lavarto, uliira mimeno, zenikat tvuna ben ubat. The Alter Rebbe, when he said tvuna, comprehension, comprehension is the name, he, he skipped the uh, stage. But the, in, in the Ariza, it says, comprehension, tevuna, which, which is, comes from the word bina, but it's a little bit different, is the lower bina. It's the lower understanding. And there are actually three tvunot, it's called. Tvuna, Aleph, Bet, and Gimel in, in the Arizo. And there's reasons for it. We don't, we're not going to get into it. If you want, it's the three parts of the He, of the letter He. There are three parts to it. So the three parts of, an, of, 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 uh, of, uh, of lower Bina, which are called three comprehensions. If you need a metaphor in the scientific world, so that's physics, chemistry, and the more scientific side of biology, not evolution. Evolution is already when Bina is in an external sense and it begins to have imagination. The power of imagination also comes from comprehension, but it's the external, the exterior of it. So evolution and everything that has to do with that is the exterior of comprehension. But physics, chemistry, and the like, uh, bioinformatics or, or uh, g- study of the genome, all these things, uh, genetics, which is biology, these things, or, or uh, biochemistry, these things are the, the, the lower comprehension of, of comprehension. But when the Alter Rebbe was speaking about this, he meant that when you're mitbunen, mitbunen does not come from bina, it comes from tvuna. It's a very important distinction. It doesn't come from the word understanding. Litbunen, which is what people translate as meditation, but really is comprehension. Even though the word meditation originally meant comprehension, it meant exactly that. To meditate was to think. But this word was hijacked from the 60s and on, actually even earlier from the 30s and on. It was hijacked, became like Eastern meditation, which is emptying your mind. But truthfully, it means to think, to comprehend. Comprehension that Chabad talks about, the Torah talks about, is meant to awaken in you either love of Hashem or fear of Hashem. It's meant to awaken your emotions. So we're learning this, trying to, from time to time, give a comprehension also. But most of what I do is, is intellectual. I don't go so much into, into how this would uh, affect a person. But there are many, many uh, teachers of Torah that will focus not on the intellectual understanding of what he's saying, but rather trying to make us feel a certain way. And, and that's and 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 the, the, it's a real art form. It's it's it's, it's 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 not easy, taking something that is intellectual and turning it into something that is emotional. But that's what Jewish meditation is about. That's what Hisbonenus is about, and that's what the Alter Rebbe meant when he said Tvuna is ben ubat. It's meant to give birth to a son and a daughter. The son and the daughter are love and fear, or love and uh, shiflas. Uh, many things that we can talk about. Okay, so we'll end here.